Hello. In this podcast, we're going to be learning about human development. In particular, the objective is that we will understand how a fertilized egg develops into a baby. Before we get to the actual fertilized egg, let's first look at gametogenesis. In these diagrams, you see the two different processes of gametogenesis. One is for how is spermatogenesis, which is how the father's sperm is produced, and the other is oogenesis, which is how the egg is produced. Basically, the gametes are, are created through a process called meiosis, and we went through the process of meiosis in an earlier vodcast. Variation is produced in two different ways. One is by crossing over in meiosis, and the other is by random, is basically the particular chromosome that goes into a particular gamete is random. It could be one homo homologous chromosome or the different same homologous chromosomes, completely random as to which the gamete will get. Also, you need to know, and this we had in meiosis too, is that the gametes are haploid. All the other ce all the ce all the other cells in your body are diploid, meaning there are two copies of every chromosome, and the sperms and the eggs have one copy of every, of every chromosome. One big difference you will see you can see between spermatic genesis and oogenesis is that in spermatic genesis four sperms are produced, and in oogenesis one egg is produced. And the main reason for this is that for sperm, quantity is what matters. You're producing, I think it's something like 2,000 sperm per second, and you need lots and lots of them so that there's a chance of, of basically fertilizing the egg. For the egg, it's quality that matters, so that for each one, it's better to have one big egg rather than four small eggs, so that the one big egg gets all the resources and there's a better chance of that one egg surviving. Because when you've got lots of sperm going through, the odds that it's going to be fertilized are profoundly better than there is that one particular sperm will reach the egg. Now, fertilization occurs here in the oviduct, also called the fallopian tube. One thing that I frequently see asked, that's one thing I see asked about in the regions more often, is that what happens here is that the diploid number is restored. The two haploid nuclei that are in the, in the egg and in the sperm, those combine, so the 40, number of 46 chromosomes in humans is restored. So you, get, so you get n plus n equals 2n. And once you have the fertilized egg, it's now called a zygote. You also need to know that the variation here is also increased by there usually being two parents, a mother and a father, each have their own set of, their own unique set of genes. The reason I say usually is because in some species, the mother and the father is the same individual. Now for twins, uh, there are two types of twins, I'm sure you know. We have identical twins, and identical twins, there comes from one embryo where very, very early in development, a couple, a couple of cells break off and develop into its own embryo. So you end up with two ident genetically identical individuals. Second kind is fraternal twins, and here, basically, two eggs are released during ovulation, both get fertilized, and they're just as genetically similar as any fully full, blood, full blooded uh, brother or sister. It, the only difference is between fraternal twins and regular brothers and sisters is that fraternal twins just happen to be born at the same time. Now we come to cleavage. Cleavage basically is rapid cell division without growth, and you end with a structure called a blastula, which is a hollow ball of cells. Um, which we'll show you using models right now. We're going to go through cleavage right now. Cleavage is basically cell division without any growth. We start here with the fertilized egg. And the fertilized egg is one of the few cells in the body which actually is visible. If you make a dot on, on a piece of paper with a pen as small as you can get, that's about the size of the fertilized egg. And within the Shortly after fertilization, the egg will divide in two. And the process for all these divisions are mitosis. So we have two, two equal cells. And this over here is just, I believe it's the polar body, which will eventually be lost. So that what happens is that when the egg goes through meiosis, then if there are four, the three other, the four cells, three of them are pushed off into here and one of them becomes the actual egg, 
which became fertilized and then split into two here. Then those two split and we end up with four cells. These cells are all identical in every way, genetically and also in terms of what they can become. These are known as embryonic stem cells, which you may have heard about in the news. And what could happen is that at this stage, at the previous two cell stage or the next couple of stages, what could happen is that if one of these cells became loose from that, then you could end up with identical twins because the, each one of these cells, because they're identical in every single way, they can become any kind of cell. And they can also become a whole new human. Two kinds of twins. They're identical twins, where they genetically they are identical. And the other is fraternal twins, where there are two separate, two, we have two separate fertilizations. One egg and one, one sperm fertilized, and a different egg and a different sperm fertilized. Now here we have the f we have the four have now divided into eight. Let me just again, and we're getting a ball of cells. And after several divisions, after about a week, and at this point we have something called a blastula, which is a hollow ball of cells. And all the cells here are virtually are identical genetically, and they are also virtually identical too because in terms of what they look like because the environment is the same for all of them and environment is everything when it comes to expression of the genes. You could not, at, the, at this stage, you would not be able to get an identical twin if one of them came off. And when the cell is in the blastula stage, this is when it leaves the, when the embryo is in the blastula stage, this is when it leaves the oviduct and enters the uterus. And then something odd happens. This is called gastrulation. The, what used to be a simple ball of cells, some of them sort of dive into the middle. And then you end up with uh, a gastrula. And what happens here is this here is a hollow end coming in. It's all hollow in here, and you've got a hole. And now all of a sudden the cells are no longer in the same environment. We now have cells that are on the outside, and we have cells that are on the inside. And we end up with a third lining of cells in here also. And what will happen is that the outer cell here, which is called the ectoderm, will eventually become parts of, parts of the body that are on the outer part, like the skin and the hair. The inner part is going to become the parts that are deep on the inside, like this part here. Like where do we have a hollow tube that goes through here? will be another opening that comes in over here. One end will be the mouth, the other end will be the anus. This part here will be the will basically be uh, the digestive si most of the, most of the digestive system. There will be an inner layer in here called the uh, so this area here is called the endoderm. There will be a middle layer over here called the mesoderm, and that will become many of the inside organs, like for example the heart and uh, the liver and such. And that is, that is cleavage. Now this brings us to a key question, and that is why is there such a variety of cells which are genetically identical? Like here are four examples of different types of cells that are in our bodies. All of them look very, very different, and all of them do very, very different things. But when you look at their DNA, you'll see that the DNA are exactly the same. How, so how could the same genes, the same instructions, produce cells that are in our intestines are in, and are involved in digestion and, and, and absorbing, absorbing nutrients? How could they be the same instructions produce, uh, the, the exact same instructions produce liver cells that can detoxify our body, that can also produce enzymes? And the same instructions also produce muscle cells that are involved in basically contracting and uh, with moving things. And the same, exact same genes produce nerve cells that send signals from one part of the body to another in terms of just uh, communication. The answer basically is this. 
that each cell has different genes which are turned on. One way you can think of it is think you've got that you have this you have this cookbook that has a whole variety of recipes. And you don't use all those recipes at the same time. With if you have been a cookbook, every day of the year you could have a different meal which involves different dishes using the same cookbook. It's just you're choosing different recipes and it's the same thing in your body. Your genome, your which is all of your all of your DNA, it's like a cookbook. Each gene is like a recipe. Each cell uses different genes, different recipes to produce that particular cell. How does a cell know which recipes to use? It's all from its location during development. That determines what kind of cell that particular cell is and what kind of cell its descendants will be. One way you can see this here is very early in a cell you could have a cell that's like on the inside, on the outside, or front and back. And you see if, that, if the cell divides vertically you've got identical cells but if you divide it horizontally then you've got two cells in a different environment and those cells can then become different things. Different environments will produce, will turn different genes on and turn different genes off. The gastrula here looks different from what you just saw in the models because at some point the gastrula flattens out and there are three layers. One layer becomes the skin and nerve cells, another becomes, that's the outer part, the inner part becomes the lining of the gut, and the middle part becomes all the other types of cells. thing to remember, and there are questions of this on the Regents exam, is that all these cells are produced by mitosis. So they're all genetically identical even though they look different. In fact, remember that every single cell in your body, except for your gametes, except for sperm and egg, all of them produced by mitosis. Sperm and egg are produced by meiosis. There's certain risks you have to be aware of during the development of the embryo and of the fetus. First thing is the earlier the problem, the more wide, the widespread the, and the worse the problem can be. Difficulty of this, of course, is that when the embryo is most at risk, the mother doesn't know she's pregnant. So unless she's trying to become pregnant, then certain then she's not going to take certain precautions. Like I think basically the only kind of medicine that is safe to take without hearing from uh, your doctor is, is basically acetaminophen or Tylenol. Anything else like what goes into you can go into the baby. There can be problems from mutations. Mutations can occur randomly, but there's some things that can cause mutations, uh, like x-rays is one thing, which is so it's very important for you not to get an x-ray if you're pregnant or you think you may be pregnant. Also, smoking can cause mutations. It can also cause other problems with uh, the fetus too. Drugs and alcohol can cause serious problems. Remember, we had a lab recently about fetal alcohol syndrome. Also, poor diet can affect the baby too. Not just not just during development, but also after birth too. Diet can have profound effects. Also, some infections, some infections, some viruses can cross the placenta and go into the embryo or the fetus. HIV is one of those. Placenta is basically what al what allows the exchange of nutrients and waste to, from the embryo or the fetus to the mother. It's an organ where, which is half made by the fetus, half made by the mother. Chief thing to remember here is both you've got the, ex the, the exchange of nutrients and wastes and that no blood is mixed. The, the blood of the mother just comes into no contact with the blood of the fetus. The, uh, the exchange is all done by diffusion, active transport, and facilitated diffusion. The placenta also replaces the corpus luteum by secreting hormones and that maintains the uterine lining. Now here's a brief summary of the different trimesters. The first trimester, the child is called an embryo, and this is where the organs form and where you see the most rapid change. 
second and third trimesters, not much seems to basically go on. It's just the child is called a fetus. All the organs have formed, but they are ba but they are developing. Baby size and fetus's size increases, and the human features become more and more refined. Now we come to our conclusion questions. First one: Which process restores the diploid number of chromosomes? Number two: List the three ways that sexual reproduction produces variation. Number three: Why do cells that are genetically identical appear and behave so differently? And number four: What is the function of the placenta? That concludes this podcast, and I will see you in class tomorrow.